how do we ensure the resilient and sustainable and inclusive growth of factoring without creating an ESL-like scenario? You know, what's happening right now in the industry in Europe, we're seeing that with the late payment regulation. I'm Dipesh Patel, host of this podcast, Trade Finance Talks, and editor of TFG. And I'm Neil Harm, Secretary General of FCI. Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, your go-to trade, treasury and payments podcast brought to you by TFG. Today, we're talking about factoring. It's a simple product with a great impact. In fact, it's estimated that volumes of global factoring are over 3.6 trillion US dollars per year, growing consistently. So what's the deal with factoring? Why do people like to finance receivables or simply put the invoice? And how can this better help global trade, economic development and lift nations out of poverty? Who more to invite to talk about factoring than the new Secretary General of FCI, the global representative body for factoring and the financing of open account domestic and international trade receivables. I'm really happy to introduce Neil Harm, Secretary General of FCI. Neil, Welcome to Trade Finance Talks. It's good talking to you. I'm looking forward to this today. First of all, quick introduction, and I hear you're a huge sports fan. So tell me what your favorite sport is and a little bit about you, Neil. Yeah, well, I have to answer first saying football, but you know the challenge with that being an American is, is most people assume that's American football, but it's not. I'm a huge U.S. soccer fan, global football fan. It's incredible to see the sportsmanship on the field, the competitiveness on the field, and there's so many aspects of it that you can bring over into leadership and running a company. So uh, it's something I love to do with my boys and love to follow every single day. Tell me a little bit about you. What were you doing before FCI? What's your background and where in the States are you from? Grown up in uh, mostly the eastern part of the United States, from Florida up through the Carolinas into uh, New York. I worked in uh, probably five or six different cities up and down the coast. You know, 30 year career from a banking perspective. All of that was around what I would call secured lending with a big focus on open account trade receivables. And then another aspect of that for a period was running an international bank in the US. So this opportunity to be in this role actually brings both of those together. I love international. I love culture. I love talking to people from around the world. And you bring that together with the factor or the product of open account receivables. It's a perfect job for me. Love it. A match made in heaven. And I guess given FCI's growth into new markets over the past few years, there's a lot to to look forward to. So as you step into your new role as sec gen of FCI, can you take a little bit of a how FCI has actually grown in the past few years and where you think FCI can expand further? What are your big ambitions for the organization? It's amazing. You know, it's a 56-year institution. You look at where it came from, a couple of countries, a couple of people in a part of Europe, you know, that's grown this into now 90-some countries, 400-some-odd members. It's amazing to see that spark of an idea 50-some years ago into what it is today. What's interesting, and it's, you know, it's history repeating itself, is you look at some of these emerging markets and how we're entering those emerging markets today. It's no different than 56 years ago. It's learning about the market. It's advocating for the product. It's educating the members on what this product is and what it isn't. Then it's watching it grow. Now, I've been fortunate over my 20 some odd years being around the FCI space is to see a market like China grow, India grow, what's happened in Africa the past 10 years. Just it's amazing. And one ways, in many ways, we're very different than we were 56 years ago in terms of the size that we are. But if you think about the roots of where we came from and what we're doing today, it's really the same thing, right? It's growing this product, educating people and supporting trade finance for corporates. Thanks, Neil. So it started with a spark, an idea, and factoring at its heart really stems from the assignment of those receivables to a funder, or in this case, a factor. And obviously, that has evolved since over the past 56 years or so. Can you talk about that evolution and also about where you see the future of factoring, be that Mm -hmm. open account and supply chain finance? It's interesting when you think about the history of it and some markets today. I was on a conversation just a few days days ago talking about Greece. Financing a receivable in Greece today is still around a post-dated check. That's how you perfect the transaction. And as it evolves in different markets, you know, you're actually able to register the receivable, show who owns that receivable so that there's a right to that receivable that turns it into what's the most important thing is an investable asset. 
You know, you've taken this piece of paper worth a thousand euros because you've registered it properly. You know what its value is. You can get trade credit financing on that. That to me is the evolution in each market. Big conversation right now is around digitization. Think about where we were as an industry just a few decades ago in some countries with the post data check. Now we're sitting here with a completely digital transaction. Getting rid of the friction in that transaction opens up the trade finance for these markets. By creating effectively an investable asset class that is allowing receivables or invoices to be sold down in the market, etc., you've created an industry, but it's also helped the businesses at heart who really do have challenges when it comes to cash flow, access to working capital. It enables them to act on more competitive financing terms. It helps them grow quicker. And I think 2022, which is the last year where we've seen the growth figures from factoring receivables finance, I think the growth increased year on year, so 21 to 22 to over 18%. And as I mentioned earlier, that global volume is around 3.6 trillion US dollars. Do you see this growth trend continuing in 2023. I must say, it's a lovely growth story, but goodness, we've had a pandemic. We've had huge macroeconomic and geopolitical uncertainties. We have several nations going into elections. We have a cost of living crisis. I could keep going on. When you think about the growth of factoring and open account receivable finance, it is going to outpace the growth of the market. So if you look at the IMF right now, you know they're predicting around a 3% growth rate as 2023 wrapped up and that same percentage going into 2024. So as we support open account trade, we're going to grow with that. So we're going to go right along with that 3%. The exponential part of that though, is that as we expand in markets like Africa, regions like Southern Asia, Bangladesh just had its first export factoring transaction done. You know, we are going to grow with just the natural volume that grows of trade, but we're going to be exponential in the fact we are going to grow in markets that have not had us there before. Ones to watch, which regions should we be watching out for when it comes to the most growth in factoring and invoice financing? And why is that so? If you think about the African region or the Southern Asian region, you know, India in particular, there's a huge opportunity for growth there as it matures with open account finance. So there's a big opportunity there. But then when you think about supply chain finance, there are markets like Europe, like the United States, where there's a huge opportunity to grow that product. It's been very successful domestically in both markets. Now there's that opportunity to take what they've learned domestically and employ it as they purchase from overseas to cross border. So two different, very different growth opportunities, but at the end of the day, two growth opportunities. Very good ones. Hey, enjoying this podcast? Hit that follow button for more. Done? Let's get back to it. And when you talk about open account and supply chain finance, obviously, they're still very new products, as you mentioned, particularly internationally, not domestically. When you look at the growth of traditional products like factoring, it's more around how can we educate the market? You mentioned Bangladesh. How do we educate the market and make that product an important thing? Is there a case for essentially leapfrogging to some of those new products like open account, supply chain? I mean, they're not that new, but is is there a case to accelerating that education of some of those newer products, building the infrastructure rather than just teaching the same old thing that's happened 56 years ago? I'll go back to Africa and the support that we've had working with the African Exxon Bank as an example. It's about that education. And to your point, the acceleration of growth in Africa in open account, in factoring and in supply chain is happening at a much more rapid pace than what you would have seen in, let's say, the United States or in Europe. And so to your point, a lot of that has to do with two things. One, it's the support of somebody in the market like the African Exxon Bank, along with the programs that we provide from an educational perspective. So you put those two powerhouses together, it's a strong force. India, we're seeing that same thing happening right now with the creation of Gift City and what we're doing with the regulators and the central bank, India XM Bank as well. So to me, and to your point, you can exponentially grow those markets at a faster rate than what we had seen historically because of the education and having local support provided as well. 
Can you go into a little bit more detail there? And, and you know, you can either use India perhaps as an example or some of the work yeah. you've been doing with Afrixim Bank to grow the product in Africa. What does it actually look like to establish a market presence of, of factoring in that region from an education, from a regulation, from a policy, from an adoption and a lender kind of perspective? Go through it in a few steps if you can. It's complex and it requires coordination and it really requires that local support. You know, we use India as an example. We were just there a few weeks ago, had an incredible event, combination of banks, financial institutions, regulatory agencies that were there. It's really all of those groups working very close together to understand how do we look at an invoice as an investable asset? What's the regulations we need to put around it? How do we secure it? And then how do we bring liquidity into the market to support it? It's really three, four, five different types of institutions that really have to work very close together to make that happen. And again, we're seeing that happening right now in Gift City with India. We've seen it happen in Africa. The key part is, again, that local institution that's willing to raise their hand and say, I'm here willing to work with someone like FCI to help build this out. So you're early on in your career as Secretary General of FCI. I want you to get your crystal ball out and talk to me as though you were leaving as Secretary General, what do you want to have achieved at FCI? What are those big milestones and goals that you have for the association to really ensure the industry is future-proofed, it's resilient at some of those huge external factors that we're talking about very regularly, whether it be that macroeconomic volatility, climate change, instability, etc. It's funny you're asking that. It's a, a very close friend of mine, when I took the role, made a comment that I remember that's surprising when he made it, but it makes sense as he said it. He's like, wow, this is a great capstone. You've had a 30-year career in what I would call being a practitioner right? I've been the lender running organizations, running factoring companies, invoice finance companies. And now to be able to take that knowledge and bring it into FCI as an association, be an advocate, be an educator, expand the market. It's rewarding. I use this word a lot, Atesh, which is fun. Yeah, I'm having fun with it. I wish this was on video because I'm, I'm smiling as I'm saying it, that I really enjoy doing this and having these conversations with the other practitioners around the world. I can instantly relate because it's what I've done for 30 years. And to say, okay, I want to help you build and grow this in your market is fun and rewarding. So, you know, when he made that comment about it being, you know, a capstone, that was a bit of a surprise to me. But I can see that at a point where you start thinking about the future and where are you at from a potential retirement at some point down the road, hopefully not anywhere near. It is a nice capstone to be able to be part of this industry globally and be a part of growing it. And again, that just to me is, is fun and rewarding. And so what are the specific goals and, and objectives and where do you yeah. see the association going? I want FCI to be three letters that come immediately top of mind when someone is thinking about open account. If we're talking about a receivable, the transaction, the financing, whether you're a bank, whether you're a regulator, we're part of that conversation. FCI is a part of it. We're not the only one. And I think that's really important. You know, we have some amazing partners around the world. And I'm going to miss some when I say this, but I'll say a few. You know, IFC, the ICC, as I mentioned, some of the, the ADB, African XM Bank. You know, those are some real partners of ours that we work with every single day. And that's part of the value that we bring in the relationship and growing this product. Thank you very much. I told you I'd give you a surprise question at the end, of course, so you don't have time to prepare for this. So another three letter word, ESL, European Super League, which I'm sure you followed the story of quite closely. Where I'm getting to is financial inclusion is really important in this industry and making sure that we progress forward as an industry without leaving others behind and make sure that I things like regulation aren't applied in an uneven manner are absolutely key. So my question to you is, how do we ensure the resilient and sustainable and inclusive growth of factoring without creating an ESL-like scenario? You know, what's happening right now in the industry in Europe, we're seeing that with the late payment regulation. It comes down to awareness, advocacy, and education. That's what FCI is there for, you know, for us to be aware of what's going on in the market, advocating as we see something happening, and then educating as fast as we can to bring people up to speed. That's a bit of what's happening with the late payment regulation. I think a lot of people are a little bit late to the game to understand it. 
what the impact is. I think even from the regulators side of the house and the PM side of the house, same thing. I think there was some education that happened almost too late. So that's our opportunity is to be ahead of those type of events as they happen around the world. The intention of it is a great intention, but it needs to be done collectively, right, with all of the partners in the room to talk through the impact and what it means to everyone from the little supplier to the big buyer and the finance that's in between them. So again, two keywords that education and partnership. Yeah. Final question, I guess, leading on to the big FCI annual meeting, which is in, in Seoul, 9th of June to the 13th of June. And, you know, on behalf of Trade Finance Global, we're delighted to be media partners of the conference. What can some of the participants expect from your annual conference later on in this year? What are going to be the key topics on your agenda and how are you going to lead the conversation in Seoul? It's something I look forward to every year. You know, I've been going to these for 20 years. Uh, now being on the other side of it is interesting, obviously. But I really take the same approach walking into it this June as I have the past 19 years. It's about awareness. It's about advocacy. And it's about education. So it's a big part of what the event's about. But most importantly, it's about an ROI. It's a return on that investment, right? The time that you're going to take to spend a week in that room, you know, with other leaders from around the world, there's a return on that investment. So I'm very focused on that. It's an opportunity for bankers to meet with each other, financial partners to meet with each other and do business. And that's what that week is really about. So a big part of it is our awareness, advocacy, and education. But the takeaway is, and the reason that people walk into that room ultimately is they need to have a return on their investment and their time. I'm very mindful of that. I share that with my team every single day, that that's why people are coming to this event. It's not to hear me speak. It's to have time with each other and learn how to do business and how to make money together. And again, take that friction out of the transaction as it goes cross border. You've heard it here first. That was Neil Harm, Secretary General of FCI, speaking to Trade Finance Global on the future of FCI, some of the top priorities for the year ahead as he steps into his new role. Neil, such a pleasure. Thank you very much for speaking to us on Trade Finance Talk. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.